obviously it's been a big week uh, around K-State finding out the news about Richard Myers uh, stepping down at the the end of the year. What was your reaction to uh, hearing that news? Well, obviously, I wasn't surprised. Uh, you know, I knew that President Myers, you know, was had been thinking about it. Um, you know, I was kind of hoping the December date surprised me a little bit, uh, not so much that he was retiring. I was hoping to get him through the, you know, the full first the, this academic year, but you know, presidential searches have a tendency to take a little while longer, so I think he was just giving everybody a good heads up, but um, we're going to miss him. Uh, I, I obviously hired me, and we've become good friends, both he and my wife and Mary Jo, and he's a tremendous, tremendous leader. What he's done for us is an athletic problem. He program, he's so supportive of our athletes and our coaches, and then obviously this university, so you know, we, we get a chance to work with him until December and maybe longer, and uh, but he's awesome, he really is. You know, in in your experience as an athletic director, or even before that, just working in different athletic departments, how different can university presidents be in terms of how much they are working with you, overseeing things from an athletic standpoint? How much can that differentiate between different uh, different places and different presidents? Very much so. Uh, you know, I've been fortunate uh, as an athletic director. I've worked for. You know, three presidents, and as the deputy at, at Iowa, you know, Gary worked for, while I was there, were two different presidents, and for the most part, I've been very lucky that presidents cared about athletics, and they were as involved as either I wanted them to be or they wanted to be, but they knew that, you know, I was fortunate enough to, they trusted me to run the athletic program. Um, I have colleagues that work for presidents that, you know, they could they don't spend as much time focused on athletics and, and they don't, I won't say they don't care about it, but it's, you know, they're kind of out of sight. And then I've had some presidents that are in the knickers every day of their athletic directors. So that is very different. And, you know, you obviously want the support. You, you, you need the support of the president's office, but at the same time, you know, you want to work for a president that wants you to be the AD and, and that's what I've been fortunate to have. So, uh, but every, I've had colleagues that maybe haven't been as uh, fortunate in terms of either more involvement than they felt they wanted or not as much involvement. This may be a stupid question then, but how, like how many decisions typically do you need the approval of a university president on, or like typically would they have a bunch of input in? You know, obviously major decisions like hiring, uh, particularly your, your head coaches, uh, again, are they involved to the point of whether – making the final decision or is it just more of informative obviously in our case president myers did talk to our top couple of candidates um but he ultimately left it up to me you know to hire chris or whoever i was going to hire at that time um but you know it's more about information and making sure they're informed and so that they don't find out something via you know the newspaper or the news or the internet or whatever, <clears throat> whatever the case may be um, you know, we're a little different here, obviously, because we're self-funded and, and we don't take any university or state support. Um, there, although we do have a board oversight that's appointed by the president, uh, the KSA board, that makes a lot of our, you know, approvals and decisions in terms of financial in particular. Uh, some schools, the president has a lot more say in some of the things that you can do or can't do. Uh, based on the, the amount of dollars you may get from the university, so uh, here we're you know we're a little more have a little more autonomy than maybe some other places I've been. But the presidents that I've worked for really want the athletic director or me in this case to run the department. They don't want to run the department. They have enough on their hands with academics, just like they expect their deans to run their academic units. So at the end of the day, it's more about informing and keeping sure that making sure that he's aware of things that are going on with us on a almost not daily basis but pretty regular basis gene taylor is talking with me you know i saw in your interview with kellis robinette of the kansas city star and and wichita eagle the other day that you brought up hey budget wise things actually have been better than you thought through what's been a pretty tumultuous last year with the pandemic what what is the latest update you can give us on where things stand as as far as finances go there yeah, we don't still have a final number of what our deficit's going to be. We're definitely going to have a deficit. Um, you know, it's it, we are projecting a bigger number, you know, back in August, September, October, just because we just didn't know if we were going to get 10 football games in or how many basketball games were, you know, were we going to 
get all of our televised games in. But as, as the year unfolded and, you know, the revenue coming in from the Big 12 is going to be a lot less than normal, but it's certainly going to be more than what we thought. Um, you know, we're projecting a lot less than the $20 million that we thought we might see as a deficit. We don't know what that number is. Again, a lot of it has to do with, you know, a natural reduction in spend expenses with the lack of recruiting travel and bringing recruits in. You know, coaches and staff members, department heads, you know, belt tightening and, and not spending the kind of money that we spent before and then just the furloughs and, and salary reduction. So all those things have helped. And, you know, we're going to have to probably dip into some reserves, uh, kind of balance the books this year, maybe uh, a short-term line of credit that we have, and then, you know, kind of dig out of it the next couple of years. But I don't think it's going to take us, you know, five or six years to get out of the steps that I think we're – we're at a number that feels a little bit better than what we thought back uh, back in August. Well, I know the sports year is not totally over yet completely. I mean, obviously baseball is still going here, and hopefully they go play well in, in Oklahoma City this week and can give themselves a chance at the NCAA tournament. But reflecting back just on the athletic year that was, I mean, I think any any fan would tell you it was not what they certainly were hoping for or expecting. No postseason for football, men's basketball, women's basketball, you know, the most high-profile sports that are here. How do you view what this last year was, considering the circumstances and then considering the results? How do you kind of sort through all of that in your mind when you evaluate it? Well, I, I think, you know, going into it, um, you know, we, we just told our coaches and our and our staff that we just needed to do whatever we could to get through the year. And not that, you know, coaches and me as an athletic director don't want to go into any year to be successful athletically in terms of wins and losses and opportunities for postseason. But with everything that we're, well, with all the uncertainties, and once we got into the year and the difficulties that each day brought with the athletes and the coaches and the support staff in terms of not knowing who was going to be out of practice or who wasn't and the testing and the isolations and, the you know, the quarantines, and everything that went along with this year, um, I was just really, really proud of the fact that we got in all of our football games, all of our men's basketball games, most of the women's basketball, most of our, not all volleyball, most of soccer. You know, soccer and volleyball went over, you know, two uh, semesters, which they never do in terms of their competitive seasons. Uh, get in the spring, and we've played all of our baseball games. So, and then just how the coaches have maintained it and handled it, and how the athletes have handled it. And, so, yes, yeah, so are we all, you know, not happy that we didn't win more, but how it was handled, the way our athletes can manage to do it, the way our coaches did, I couldn't be more proud of of how they got through the year. Um, it was a challenge on everybody, you know, not just in the athletic department, but our medical staff in particular, the stress on them throughout the year. So the fact that we got through it, uh, I think we all grew from it. And, uh, again, I think, as we go for looking forward to next year, the expectations are going to be much higher. There's no question. But I was just really, really proud. And I kind of, I didn't put completely wins and losses aside, but as you look at how basketball finished and where football was before, you know, they lost some pretty key players. And, you know, volleyball had really a good year this year, you know, was just outside of the NCAA tournament. So, you know, overall I felt you know, we got to work, got through it as well as we possibly could, and that's what I'm most proud of. Gene Taylor is talking with me right now. Along those lines, does it feel to you right now, talking between yourself, your your colleagues in the league, that things are going to be? I mean, barring unforeseen circumstances, nobody can predict. Nobody could have predicted the pandemic, but that it will be a virtually normal year for athletics next year. Yeah, as we have our you know AB meetings and talking to colleagues. You know, my colleagues, yeah, everybody's looking forward to as full of stadiums as they can have and, you know, a regular fall football camp or fall sports camp in terms of preparation for the fall season and all the things that we felt like we would never have interrupted before 2020, everybody's really looking forward to. And we had just kind of a, you know, a, a straw poll today or yesterday on one of my calls with the Big 12 schools and, all of them are anticipating 100% capacity. All of them are anticipating, you know, regular operations within their stadiums. Um, and again, like you said, you, you kind of put an asterisk there to say, as long as the pandemic doesn't come back and bite us in the, you know, the rear end sometime this summer. But we are hopeful that it's not going to be the case. 
One thing that we saw this week also, I believe that was earlier this week, right? The the announcement about the power cap porch at uh, Bill Snyder Family Stadium. I know it's something you alluded to earlier on on an interview with us here on the show, but how where what will be the details of that specifically? And if you are somebody, I know like as a fan, I'd be thinking, okay, if I'm there, will I have a good sight line of the game? Will I be able to see the game? Just what can you fill us in on the details there if you are going to be grabbing some drinks on the power cap porch? Well, as we were kind of designing this, you know, the, the area between the, the, the Shamrock Zone and the, and the east side, we realized the work we had to do wasn't going to cost us a lot more to turn it into kind of a, um, a Wabash Cannonball type of area um, that we could open up a little bit more to the public. And so it, you're not going to be able to necessarily view into the field necessarily because it's going to be set back a little ways. But, you know, we'll have TVs in there and, and there'll be, you know, we'll have some tents and ways to kind of, if there is a weather issue, but you'll be able to go in there throughout the game. Um, you know, you have to have a, you know, kind of stay within that area to have your beverage. You won't be able to bring your beverages out. But I think it gives, you know, fans that maybe don't want to go all the way up to their car at halftime or during the game to go grab a beverage and, uh, you know, if, if it's, you know, rainy, get out of the rain a little bit, or if it's too hot, get underneath an umbrella. But I think it's going to be a nice addition to the stadium. And the Wabash is more of a private area on a game-by-game basis. This will be open, obviously, for those that are 21 or over. Uh, and so I think it'll be a nice addition and a good way to give another piece of entertainment for our fans. You know, it seemed to me that the reaction was generally pretty passionate on both sides from people who were talking about whether it's the pass outs or alcohol being sold in the stadium. Since you guys came out and announced what the plan was going to be this year, not the full alcohol sales in the stadium, still have the pass outs. How, how passionate has the response been on both sides of that to you? Well, I, I think people, you know, the people that didn't want us to go uh, full alcohol sales were happy. And the folks that um, wanted a full alcohol at least know they can either go to the power cap porch or go out to their car and then get a beverage and, and you know so i think i don't know the best of both worlds necessarily you never can please everybody but um you know the real passion is the one of us to completely sell alcohol everywhere and those that didn't uh, were pretty pretty adamant about it so i think that's one of the reasons we looked at this power cap porch to give those that wanted a beverage to go in and get it and you know uh, be in a contained area and still uh, be able to, for those that didn't want it, to still sit and watch a game and not have people drinking around them. So it's going to be a continuation of conversations probably over the next couple of years until we make a decision one way or the other. But at this point, this is the first step in at least providing another opportunity for fans that do want to 